is episode number 180 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And it's a new month, which means a new topic. And this month, we're going to be focusing and doing a deep dive on ice. Uh, so we actually have two people we're interviewing today. Um, so I hope you enjoy this podcast. Cheers. Everyone, welcome back and to the Mixology Talk podcast. So today, we're going to break things up a little bit. We actually have two guests that we're going to be talking to because there's so much nerddom around ice that it takes at least two different people to, to kind of uh, cover this topic. So today, I have a very uh, special guest, somebody I'm really excited to talk to, um, and that is Scott Kleinbell of Kleinbell. What's the name of your company? Kleinbell Equipment Company. There we go. Perfect. How are you doing, Scott? You know, can't complain. It's a beautiful day out here in Colorado, enjoying the sunshine, and happy to talk about some ice with some ice geeks. Oh, perfect, man. So as you may know, uh, Craft Cocktails has gotten behind ice in a big, big way. Um, you know, we geek out on it, and, uh, you know, we're looking for basically any excuse to uh, manipulate ice in cool new ways. Um, so I thought you would be the perfect person since you produce some pretty cool machines. Um, so for anybody that hasn't heard of Klein Bell, uh, can you give us a little bit of description of how they may have interacted with kind of the end products that you produce? Absolutely. So we've been around since 1964. We're past our 50 year anniversary. Um, but, you know, decades ago, my grandpa in his garage invented the machine that makes clear blocks of ice for ice sculpting. Uh, they're a 300 pound block that are 20 feet uh, wide, 40 feet long, 10 feet thick, or sorry, 10 inches thick, 40, 20, 10 inches. Um, and for, you know, a bunch of years now, we've been servicing the uh, ice sculpting portion of the industry. They've been uh, behind our product and using it for everything from ice hotels to ice sculpting. Uh, but really, in the last couple of years, we've seen a huge shift in the market and the demand for the clear ice over to, like you said, the craft cocktail geeks who are looking for any excuse to manipulate their ice into something new. Yeah. And so just to kind of get context here, we're not talking about like throw something in your garage and fire it up over a weekend to get some nice ice. We're talking pretty large commercial settings, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So the main machine that we've been operating for years uh, is the CB300. It has a pretty good name share in the market, um, but it, it produces two 300-pound blocks of ice. It's a three-day freezing cycle to get that 10 inches of ice uh, to come out of the machine. But you know, you're looking at 600 pounds of ice production a day split up into two 300-pound blocks. Um, everything is run through gantry cranes and placed onto large tables, you process down with chainsaws. So, um, you know, that that portion of the industry and, and what we've been used to supplying has definitely been uh, more geared towards a commercial industrial process. Got it. And then we were talking before we uh, started recording here um, that you guys have started doing some smaller scale machines as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So here in the last year, uh, we've finally been able to get pared down in size because we've seen the demand and the people who are looking for that two inch, three inch uh, spear, whatever it might be to put into their glass. And they're looking at a 300 pound block and saying, how in the heck am I going to be able to deal with this? So, um, you know, it, it took us a little while to get a, a viable design pulled together, but we just in the last year or two have launched the uh, CI4 and CI2. Um, which both make a 25-pound block that doesn't require any additional mechanism. It can be picked up and moved around by hand. So uh, the difference between the two, the CI4 is producing four 25-pound 25 25-pound blocks um, in a 24-hour free cycle, and the CI2 is producing two 25-pound uh, blocks in that 24-hour free cycle. So um, we've seen some great reception, definitely from the craft ice side of it, just because people are finally able to, you know, in a little bit more confined setting or a little bit uh, less commercial setting, be able to take that ice and process it down into something that they can use. Perfect. And um, I remember when you told me that, I was I was amazed uh, because Kleinbell has such a kind of street cred uh, for craft cocktail bars. We all kind of want one, um, but usually it's a matter of I can't afford it or it's just too stinking big. There's no way I can manhandle 300 pound blocks of ice. So having yeah, something it, with a smaller footprint, um, and I'm sure a corresponding price tag, hopefully, is going to be uh, hopefully uh, very exciting for people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're excited to be able to service this industry a little bit better. Perfect. So, 
for anybody at home um, that is making ice at home um, and wants kind of clear ice, usually what we what we see is a um, a technique called directional freezing, uh, where you put a cooler filled with water in a freezer and it freezes from the top down. Now you guys do something. Your method for freezing um, is similar but slightly different, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at directional freezing, that's about half of the equation. Um, you really want to make sure that you're freezing from one direction. And all the cooler does is confine the freezing to one out of six sides. Um, our machine is exactly the same. It has a cold plate on the bottom. Um, but rather than, you know, a commercial chest freezer or, you know, a, a residential freezer that relies on ambient temperature to pull down the, the temperature of the water and actually produce the ice, we have a direct contact to a cold plate at the bottom. So we're pulling the heat directly out of the water rather than pulling the heat out of the air and the air pulling the heat out of the water. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, the other difference that you're going to see is because we're able to dictate where we freeze from with that direct contact freezing plate, we freeze from the bottom up. That gives you a couple of different advantages. Number one, uh, you know that ice expands 9% as it freezes. So um, it gives you the ability to expand that ice out towards the top rather than building pressure as it builds downwards. Um, the other thing that it gives us the ability to do is to circulate or move the water as it's going. So um, that's kind of the secondary portion to release some of those dissolved gases that are inside of it, some of the minerals, um, any of the processing chemicals, including your chloride, chlorines and fluorides. Um, all of that gets kicked out in the process, which is something that you know, directional freezing for at least the first couple of inches does a decent job with, we're able to do it for 10 inches. So what you end up with essentially is a 300 pound block of crystal clear ice, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're not dealing with that cloudiness at the very edge um, or anything that really needs to be trimmed off. There's a little bit on either end that might need to be cut off of our blocks, but um, really you get a nice uh, full depth of clear ice, which is uh, you know, a nice necessity when you're trying to cut down into any of the additional shapes that you're looking for. Um, and one thing that you can also do with that is it gives you an ability to add in uh, additional artistic elements into the block that can come out with, you know, that clear ice all the way around it. There's a great company that we work with in Scotland uh, that is called Edinburgh Ice Company, and they've done some great work. They're all over Instagram and Facebook if you want to go check it out. Um, but they're really good at uh, adding additional decorative elements into it, you know, everything from uh, almost like an exploded strawberry inside of a full spear of ice to, you know, a full head of wheat inside of it, um, anything from flowers to um, licorice root and uh, orange peels, you know, anything that you might want to be able to use or add a little bit of flavor with, um, even down to some textures, you know, they had a bar that they were working with that was doing a, a honey-based drink. And they were able to add in a honeycomb texture to the ice. So at that point, it's not just, you know, a decorative element, but it can actually add into the overall uh, sensory input that the end customer gets from the piece of ice, which is fantastic. Oh, I think you muted. And you said that uh, the name of your company was the Edinburgh Ice Company? Yep, the Edinburgh Ice Company. They're based out of Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, some great people over there. They've been running our equipment for quite a while. And and some of what they're able to produce is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, and they're not the only ones. We have customers spread all over the country and all over the world that are doing a lot of very creative things with the ice. Um, I know we have a couple of customers that, uh, like I mentioned, the honeycomb have been able to do almost like a snakeskin texture. Um, we have a bunch of people that have frozen actual money into the ice um, just to add a little bit of extra flair. Um, we have some people who have done uh, gold leaf frozen into it, which adds a really, really interesting, you know, decorative element into the glass. Well, so um, would you mind, do you know how they do it? Is this like, cause that's a, an amazing technique or is this kind of a skill of an ice carver or is this something that, Absolutely. yeah, that we could find no, on YouTube maybe? <laughs> I don't know if there's any YouTube videos, but it's pretty simplistic. So because we're freezing from a singular direction, the key is to get it into a layer of ice as it's coming up. So um, I know a lot of the ice carvers in in past have had almost like a grid that they put over mm -hmm. the freezing chamber with alligator clips that came down, and they would just hold the element in place until it started freezing in. 
then they'd remove the alligator clip. And as it kept freezing, it just frees up around whatever they're trying to add into it. That's so crazy. Yeah. So, so you know, you kind of do like a, almost like a reverse topography map where as the ice starts to build up, you can have essentially a bunch of different layers with different textures and components and all these things Absolutely. that would still end up crystal clear. Absolutely. You know, there's an artist that we also had done a little bit of talking with. Um, she's still just freezing in five gallon buckets, but she's done some fantastic work with flowers. And she'll actually, you know, add a little bit of water, get the flower the way she wants it, dump out whatever she doesn't need and create a full design within it. And that's something that could absolutely be done within our equipment. It just takes time and the artistry and the skill, you know. Absolutely. Um, would you mind uh, telling me her their name, and I can include it in our show notes because I, I I'm fascinated by this stuff as yeah. well. I think the world of yeah. ice is its own thing, and it has its own personalities and skills. Oh, and absolutely, um, absolutely. It's almost like the last frontier. Um, I don't know her name off the top of my head, but I'd be more than happy to email it to you after we're done, and you could add it into the notes for people to go check out. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. And I think that, um, you know, like I said, you know, we're kind of at the forefront of, you know, or right at the beginning of the whole ice um, knowledge as far as craft cocktails. And I know that Absolutely. there's so much stuff out there, especially with um, ice artists and carvers out there that have been mm -hmm. doing this for decades. Um, and I think that we can learn a lot from seeing what other people are capable of and kind of what they're yeah. adding to the marketplace. I think it would be really fascinating. Absolutely. Yep, there's a, a bit of an untouched knowledge base there that I think people are definitely going to enjoy getting in and playing with. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so, Scott, where can people find more information out uh, about your company? Um, do you have a great social media platform that you guys like to promote or website? Yeah, so we're on Facebook. Uh, we're more active on Instagram. Uh, both of those are under the same handle, Climbell Equip, uh, just Climbell Equipment without the mint. Um, and then we're obviously uh, a great website over at climbbellequipment.com. Perfect. And uh, is there any other machines or seminars or anything else you'd like to promote that you have coming up? No, I think we got the major ones for the industry uh, mentioned in here. And beyond that, excited to see where people go from, uh, from here with our ice. Awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So now that we know kind of how these large format ice cubes are made, 300 pound blocks, that's pretty huge. Uh, let's talk to somebody about how they get it from 300 pounds down to fitting in your glass. Hi there, uh, my name is Gordon Belliver. I'm one of the owners of Penny Pound Ice here in Los Angeles, California. And thank you so much for joining us, man. I definitely appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so as you know, bartenders are kind of really excited about ice right now. I mean, we've been that way for, for a while now, but I think we started to really realize how important different types of ice and um, the importance of clear ice and all that. Um, but to kind of start the story, um, how did you get into the whole ice world? For sure. Um, so I was bartending at the Varnish, um, LA staple, um, and my now business partner, uh, business partners, Eric Alpern and said Moses own the varnish and essentially penny pound came out of the varnish. The, the cocktail program there is very classic focus. Uh, and Eric who had gotten his chops bartending in New York, um, part of the milk and honey family under Sasha Petrosky, um, took the idea to Los Angeles to open this classic cocktail bar, the varnish with its own, um, ice program, essentially relatively new to the city um, back when it opened in 2009. I think that's right. It's either 2008 or 2009, and I usually get it wrong. Um, but so the varnish was one of my first bartending jobs. So I was very fortunate that I had these pre-cut clear rocks and spears and shaking ice. Um, that That's how I learned to bartend. Um, I never really did a lot of like molds or breaking down my own blocks when I first started, um, things like that. But the company essentially evolved out of the varnish mainly because other people and other bartenders would come to the varnish and wanted their, wanted to have that product at their bar, at their restaurant. So they would ask Seth or ask Eric, like, Hey, can, like, can I get this? Can you sell this? And it was never really designed 
in the beginning to be like its own entity. Um, and you know, one day I just asked Eric if he needed some help. Um, and he said, yeah. And a couple years later I made partner, uh, and here we are. I mean, when I started, there was no website. Um, any phone call went to Eric's cell, any, there wasn't even an email address. Like it was just like Eric's Gmail account. So the company has grown and evolved massively. Like when I first started, there were, I think 30 accounts, 20 of them were inside of the 213 hospitality group already. So like the branch, there wasn't a lot of branching out. Um, and you know, pre COVID, um, in February or March of this year, we were in inching towards um, 200 clients in Southern California. So, yeah, it's been it's been some serious growth getting Clear Ice, Big Ice to programs all over the state. Um, and you know, once COVID ends, hopefully we can we connect with a lot of our our old friends and family. So it literally is a business created out of demand. Yeah, more or less. Um, yeah. I wasn't really doing a lot of quote unquote, like sales, like I didn't have like a, a rolling case and I would go into bars a lot. Most people were reaching out to us or, you know, somebody like somebody like you who knows about clear ice, who wants clear ice is just contacting us directly, or they worked at a bar somewhere that had this. And now they got a promotion to go be a, a GM or a beverage director over here. And then we would just go with them. So it was a very natural progression. Um, and then when we started expanding into wider markets like um bakersfield and palm springs and temecula and san diego and malibu and santa barbara like they were all you know um one of my one of my coworkers, josh fox has this theory called the like the neighborhood effect mm -hmm. where it's like if you go to a bar or if somebody at a bar starts carrying our ice there's going to be either another bartender who comes in or some clientele who comes in and sees this and then that sort of like spreads in and of itself where people don't want to, now they know what it's like to have a big clear ice cube. So then they want it for themselves as well. And so slowly the neighborhood just like becomes a big ice spot for us. Um, yeah. It's, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, so, that, so that before COVID, that was kind of our business model was just word of mouth really. Sure. Um, obviously these days a little bit different um, when we've had to pivot more towards uh, grocery stores and liquor storms and a lot of direct to consumer stuff. Um, but you know, making it work, we're still here. Yeah. And, and so do you guys do home deliveries as well? If somebody's interested in it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it does cost a lot for us to just have the trucks on the road because they're, uh, refrigerated trucks and we have a uh, four of them at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, if you want a bag, we'll deliver it. And it's just if you're willing to pay the delivery fee, you can also come downtown if you want and pick up as well. Um, but we realized that we needed to get, we need to really grow that base um, as much as we possibly could. Because there are a lot of, there are a lot of home enthusiasts out there. There's a lot of people who miss those, you know, those creature comforts of being in a bar um, or bartenders who haven't been able to make drinks and want to make drinks like they used to. And so, it's, it's been good. It hasn't been great, but it's been good. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so one, one of you mentioned expensive like trucks and delivery and all that stuff, but the equipment you guys use too is not cheap either. Right. So, um, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the machines that you use for, for ice production? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the climb bell machines aren't cheap, but my, my point of view with that is those things are workhorses. I mean, it, we can have machines going for years on end, making blocks, turning blocks, you know, week after week after week without any real hiccups. Um, and it's, it's fine. It's great. Um, on the other side of machines that we use, we have a couple cold draft machines. Um, and we also have a couple Scotsman machines for Pebble Ice. Uh, those we've, we've had like a, a few that we've purchased outright and a few that we've, um, least just because it's easier to do that but for those you know that that nugget machine i think the scotsman is the best um and then the cold draft machine we realized we wanted to bring opportunities for for bars and for bartenders so that's why we started getting those machines in the first place because not a lot of venues may want or have the ability for big ice but 
a lot of bars have pebble ice machines, have cold rack machines. And, you know, if they go down or they need more, there's an event, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's kind of where we got those from. So yeah, those three, those three main machines are, are the three main ones that we use. Yeah. And I remember um, when I was tending bar in San Francisco, um, our ice machines, and I'm sure you probably have a lot of experience with this and nightmares probably is, uh, you know, especially when it gets hot, it just taxes the engines, taxes everything about those ice makers and they'll go down the hottest part of the day in the worst, you know, after right into a three day or four day weekend, you're just like, you gotta be kidding me. So having somebody yep. like you guys up and running, I think is probably saving a lot of businesses. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we, when we first got those machines, it was one of those things where it's like, we couldn't even, we were trying to keep up harvesting as much as we could that we couldn't even really keep any in our storage. These days we're trying to keep close between any, we're between like 500 to a thousand pounds ready to go on hand just in case. Now by like standard, like ice company numbers, that's nothing. Like the, I've seen ice companies, you know, that are shipping pallets upon pallets of ice out. But for us in a tiny little walk-in with, big climb bell blocks and stuff like that, you know, a thousand pounds can take up, take up a good chunk of space. Yeah. And, um, so, and then with the climb bell, how big are those blocks when they come out? Depending on the day and depending on the machine and depending on the heat and depending on the pump placement and depending on like ambient temperature in the factory, uh, anywhere, anywhere, usually roughly between like 10 by 20 by 40 inches. Um, about 300 pounds so they're not they're not small um and generally what we try to do is break down as many as we can in one day because with covid you know labor is tight and we can be spread having all these four trucks out on the road at once um so we try and save like for one heavy production day where we can break down um as many blocks as we can. And actually, I think tomorrow we're going to slip break down about 18 blocks and it should take us about three to four hours, but we'll see. Wow. So, and when we talk about um, breaking down large, large format ice, how do you, how do you guys go about it? Cause I've seen it done a handful of times um, because sure. 300 pounds is, it's not two guys picking up a big block, I imagine. No, it's not. <laughs> um, so it, the first thing that we have to do is we have to let them temp. So it, and the last thing we want to do is we don't want to let them temp too fast because then they can shatter. So then the block itself can start to like splinter and crack in parts. So it's this huge dance where once we pull them out of the machine, we usually need to cover them in a blanket or a tarp so that they're not exposed to the external temperature around it. Um, temping is a very important part of dealing with big ice. Um, but once it's temped, which usually can take depending again on a lot of factors, an hour, two hours, maybe three. Um, that's when we start chainsawing. Uh, we have, you know, set marks of how big we want the slices to be depending on what style of cut we're using. Um, but if we start cutting and we start to see that the block starts to like splinter or fragment or anything like that, block's still too cold, pause, whatever, figure something else out. Um, but assuming all goes well, we cut it down into loaves. So a block usually gets broken down into five or six big pieces. And then from that, it goes to the, you know, the quote unquote, like the assembly line where we have three bandsaws cutting the necessary cuts that they need to make to get it to the final size. So right now we have four main styles of ice sizes that we cut. Um, and each one of those saws is doing a specific cut to get to that final that final production then once it's cut then we have to throw it back in the freezer because now that it's so temp so that we could cut it we need to make sure that it doesn't melt and become deformed so then we have to refreeze it before we can package it and before we can distribute it so it's a uh, cold slippery uh dangerous business <laughs> that is under a lot of time constraints uh, to get the machine out, make sure that, or get the block out of the machine, make sure that it's okay, cut it down before it's totally melted and all the hard lines of the edges are gone and then refreeze it so that we can get it on the road in time. So it's a, it's a serious dance that we have to do. Okay, so now I have some serious questions for you. Like all of this is very interesting, right? Because 
Okay. Um, I've seen it broken down and I've, um, in like a couple demonstrations and stuff like that, but I've never broken down large format eyes. So sure. first off, chainsaw. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have, like when I think chainsaw, I think this big greasy chain kind of whipping through a tree and a, you know, the, the um, gas and the oil are kind of mixing to lubricate the chain and all that stuff. How, how do you guys deal with the food safety side of this? Uh, don't buy a gas chainsaw. Fair enough. Go electric. Go sure. electric. Um, and you don't actually need oil. Um, it will help and will lubricate the chain, but because it's cutting into the ice and the ice is wet and forming this kind of snow, that if the blade, if the, the blade itself isn't super taut um, and a little bit more relaxed, then it can cut through the ice without having to be lubricated because the ice and the snow itself is going to do the lubrication for you. Sure. Um, and then the bandsaws don't need oil uh, as well. They are, they're food grade designed. So like they're designed to cut down huge slabs of meat. So those also don't need oil. So that's how we keep the ice uh, from coming into contact with some unsavory products and affecting quality that way. Perfect. And then do you have a particular brand of chainsaw that you like? Because I've seen the uh, Harbor Freight version being used quite a bit. My, I like the Steels, S-T-I-H-L. Um, that is my preferred style. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's all, it's all uh, preference. I guess the biggest thing that I would do is if you're ever trying to chainsaw is uh, don't go too fast um, and loop whatever extension cord you're using into your pants or like into your like belt buckle kind of thing because the last thing that you want to do is like not be paying attention and then either disconnecting the saw because you're pulling too hard or like maybe even or like the saw the extension cord is in front of the block and then you risk cutting that so um doing that but it's all it's all preference like we've played around with a lot of different manufacturers blade sizes stuff like that it's um it's just one of those practice things. Like you'll get better at it the more you do. I think, you know, uh, in a given week back when it was busy, I was spending about three to four hours a day chainsawing blocks down. Just, you know, you get better at it. It's gotta be pretty therapeutic though too, right? <laughs> like you really have to like focus and it's all, you know, earmuffs and uh, goggles on, like kind of just like silence the world out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's interesting. Very cool. Um, and then uh, with the meat band, so do you have a particular brand that you like with that one? Um, Pro Cut. Pro they, I mean, it's, 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 it's the standard one from what I can tell. Sure. Um, you're just looking for a, a, Stainless steel, bandsaw. Um, our current facility doesn't have a ton of electrical capabilities. I would love to try one on a 220. Um, the ones we have right now are only on a 110 just because we don't have the, like I said, the electrical capabilities for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that I don't, uh, that's one of those things where it's like I haven't really played around with very much. Sure. Just because like we got one that was recommended to us and that worked and that's what we've used. Cool. And then um, you said you have four main types of ice. What, uh, what are the, the types that you usually break down to? For sure. So um, our main one is the rock. Um, it's our most common one. It's our most popular item. A lot, of, a lot of ice companies and a lot of bartenders are really interested in a two by two. Um, when Eric first started the company, he didn't like a two by two. Um, one of his like biggest pet peeves when it comes to ice is like, you never want to take a sip of something and have a like piece of ice shooting at your shooting at your nose or your teeth or anything like that. So he designed the rock to be taller and skinnier. So it's essentially the same volume as a two by two, but it's one and three quarter, one and three quarter by two and a half tall. So it sits taller in the glass. So when you do just a slight tip, like it does, it does touch your nose and your or your lip or your teeth or whatever like that. But it's not like flying at you. Um, so that's our most popular, biggest seller. Like 70% of our sales is that guy. Um, we have two sizes that are kind of like little variations off of that. So there's the stone, which is smaller. And then we have the Normandy, 
which is the same height as the rock, but just fatter. Um, and that got its name from the Normandy club. Um, uh, also part of the hospitality group, um, because they had wider glasses. And so the rock would sit in there and it would just kind of look weird because it didn't take up as much space as they needed it to. So we started cutting the specific size for them. So those are the three main styles, the three main sizes for like stuff served down or sipping or old fashioned style. Um, and then we have one uh, tall, skinny, like Colin style, uh, and that's our spear. So those are the four main ones. Um, and then if you're looking for something larger, like a DIY style, we do have a cinder block as well. Um, that's a legitimately the size of a cinder block. So it's five by seven by 10. It's about a 15 pound block of, of clear ice um, because there are some bars that have the skills and the knowledge of breaking down big blocks themselves or again, home bartenders as well. So that's again, that DIY, it gives you that more like um, au natural, realistic hand cut feel to it because the ice isn't perfectly like straight. Got it. So it's a little bit more of kind of that organic process if you don't have the the straight ruler and kind of the uh, a bandsaw fence and all that. Exactly. Um, I mean, it, they look great in in glasses, and you know, if they have, if the bartenders have the the knowledge to break down, which again, it's just practice. Like, uh, but they can be fun for that. Yeah, that kind of authentic, natural feel to it. Yeah, and it adds a little bit to the show if you have this big block of ice that you can kind of carve in the right setting, obviously. Um, sure. To yeah. add to the atmosphere and the theater of it all. That's cool. Yeah. Excellent. So um, while we're still on ice, I have um, kind of a question for you. Um, sure. You already kind of touched on one of them. Um, uh, basically, how, do you, how can you ruin a block of ice? Like if you're first time running through it, um, you already mentioned if it's not tempered enough, it'll start to splinter and crack. But how are some ways um, that a big block of ice could get ruined? Um, I mean, there, there's a lot. I've, I've seen a lot. Um, so, yeah, if it's not tempered and it can fracture too quickly, um, I've noticed recently that if our pumps haven't been cleaned very well, then sometimes the impurities that have kind of like uh, ended up on those they're not getting moved around as well. So that can affect it. Um, the, when you're chainsawing, like if you're not, you know, chainsawing straight down and you're going like this, and then that's throwing off a lot of waste for that. Um, in terms of like breaking down one at home, um, again, tempering is a huge thing. And by, for those who don't know what tempering, I mean, it's just like the ice needs to come relatively to temp of the air temperature that it's around so if it's like it needs to start to like melt otherwise it'll splinter when you do that but when you're cutting it down um on your own it's like a i don't know how to explain this it's a combination of like gentle taps but also very purposeful taps at the same time like you don't want to just take a mallet and just go just like whack the hell out of it because you're kind of like up in the air with that but you know, you don't want to do like light little like think think things. Like you need to be intent on where you're going and knowing what you're going to try and yield out of it, um, and just understanding that you might have some off cuts or some misplaced ones as well. Um, but for that too, just like you just need to practice. It's it's a skill that you know bartenders in Japan do for hours on end, day in day out, and you know we try and model them poorly but it's uh it's very therapeutic and again like you said it has that very authentic feel once you can see what you can do with an ice block yourself once you break it down got it so it sounds like um the biggest thing is um tempering has to be kind of perfect um or else the block itself is just not ready to 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 use um and just be deliberate about and it sounds like experience um, is, you know, trial and error, run through it a couple of times, make sure you got it down um, and just make sure you're, you're very focused on what you want to get out of this block. Exactly. Cool. Excellent. Um, so one of the things you touched upon is the pumps and uh, I kind of want to circle sure. back with this because I think I missed this on the, the freezing process and all that, but how important is um, your water composition and having quality water to make your ice? Sure. 
Um, in my experience, it's kind of, it's more important for the Scotsman and the cold draft machines. Um, the, the filtration system that you have for that can affect those machines more in terms of um, clear, clear quality and just quality of the overall product. From the Kleinbell machines, um, we've tried a couple things. And uh, so like one time I wanted to, to play around to see if we could recapture um, some water. So we took off cuts of ice from previous blocks, melted them, and then poured them into uh, a climb bell to try and freeze them. And it was shocking how dirty that water was based on the impurities that were already in them. And then the fact that the pumps can only do so much, like they're only really able to, to keep some parts going. And so we had just like totally overloaded it. Like the pumps couldn't keep all those impurities going. There were too many over there because they were off cuts. So they were the impurities from the other block. So uh, water quality is important, um, but maintaining your pumps and cleaning your pumps and checking on them is just as important. Like if you're like, oh, I've got a reverse osmosis system, like it's going to make the clearest blocks ever. It's like, well, I mean, that's only like half the battle, but um, we just have a simple carbon filtration system. Um, you know, something you would see in like a pure or a Brita filter. Um, and that coupled with consistent pump cleanliness and general stuff like that is to me the best way to ensure as clear of a block as you can get. It sounds like if you took that off cut, it almost like a, uh, a sourdough starter for a bad ice experience. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sort of like that. I mean, you know, cause the, uh, the metaphor that we've always used for the climb bells is that like the impurities rise to the top and then you scrape that top off. Like you would, you know, the same way that cream rises to the top, take the cream off and you're left with milk. So we had tried to take all of this heavy cream and throw it into a new block to see if we could get, you know, clear milk out of it. And it just did, it just did not work. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, the, the pump cleaning and the pump maintenance is just as important, uh, if not more than water. It's a simple carbon filter is, is plenty to do. Uh, for Perfect. Perfect. There you are. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that I don't know if that's internet on my end or okay. Yeah. So um, one of the other things that we talked about, you you brought up was a Scotsman and cl uh, cold draft. Um, I know mm -hmm. a lot of people kind of are very hesitant with cold draft just because I, my understanding is they break down a lot. Is there any tips you sure. have for uh, keeping those guys running um, constantly or um, what are you breaking down basically? Is, uh, with that, it's kind of like the, we, we found it easier to harvest everything in the bin at once and let that kind of build up because once it builds up, then it'll, the machine will calm down. Um, there, I mean, isn't a lot. I mean, they're workhorses as well, but something about them, yes, they tend to break down more, but the product they produce is, is good and what we need. True. Um, the only thing that I've noticed in terms of like trips to tricks to like helping is <laughs> as much as, a, as much of a say as you can say when things are being built out, like don't put them in an unventilated room. <laughs> and if you have to put them in an unventilated room, put a fan next to that condenser and just keep air blowing away from it as much as it possibly can. Cause it's going to heat up and then it's going to break down on you. So if your if your owners or whoever's designing it wants to put it in like a dish room or what is essentially a closet, you should strongly advise them not to do that <laughs> unless you want to have an exhaust fan somewhere right there because that thing is just going to heat up. Yeah. Um, You're giving me a lot of like flashbacks of when I was in a bar because we, we made that mistake. Oh, yeah. You have constraints, right? Um, yeah. So they did the, they put the compressor for the beer lines in essentially the worst possible place. They almost put it in the oven. It might as well have been. And uh, sure. like when it got over 85 degrees in San Francisco, the whole line would just shut down. Like oh, you yeah. pour a beer I mean, to we, all know, we all know those dish pits that are like, oh, feel like saunas, saunas because yeah. just, it's just terrible. But like, you know, that's what they have to do, but it's not where it should go. Like it needs, it needs proper ventilation. It needs as much air circulation as you can give it. Um, 
and just make good friends with your technicians because you're going to call them and you're going to need them ASAP. Uh, so make sure you either know where backup cold draft can come from. Also, have a rough idea of how much ice you go through in a night. That is, that is something that still to this day surprises me because people will be like, I don't know, like I got like five wells and it's going to be a Friday. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I, I don't know. I don't know how much ice that is. I don't know how much ice you're, you're shaking with. I don't know how much you're burning at the end of the night. Like there are so many things that you can do. I don't know. So, yeah. uh, yeah. That's just funny. I, I actually did me. an event in San Francisco for, um, uh, a liquor company and I didn't know how to use cold graph. I hadn't used it at this point or the big format ice. So I ordered probably four times as much as I needed. And at the end of the oh, night, yeah. I was literally throwing bags of cold draft down the dirt or down into the, to the gutters so they could melt out. I was like, this was yeah. a waste of time, money, and energy. But literally throwing money down the drain right now. I mean, there, there are ice companies uh, that I've seen. Like if there's a big, you know, back when people went to bars and could go to bars, they're like a big holiday weekend or a big like party weekend ice trucks would just sit at sit at the end of a street and just wait for the call. And like, you know that somebody's going to go out of cold draft or burn through their cold draft or their cold draft machine is going to go down and they're going to wheelbarrow up, you know, like a thousand pounds of cold draft and get that money right away. Like I, we our our philosophy was cold draft was like, you know, it's, it's all part of a good bar program and cold draft is on the, on the better end of machine made ice. Mm -hmm. than some of the other ice machines that I'm sure we've all seen, like the Crescent Moons or the little, like, uh, like soda. Yeah, exactly. Banquet ice. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if you need some cold draft, we wanted to help. We wanted to give you all the things you need so that we could support your entire program. Um, uh, and that's where we got it. It's, but yeah, they, they work hard, but they can, they can break down hard too. So sure. Like I said, just make friends with your technicians and have an idea of how much ice you normally go through in a sh- in a service. Absolutely, no, that's great advice. Um, so you've given us a lot of experience and a lot of uh, your kind of insights into ice and all that. Um, is there anything you guys are working on on your end? Anything you want to promote um, that you'd love more people to know about? Yeah, um, COVID has been like a mixed bag of of sorts. You know, it's allowed us to really focus on our company as a whole. And so we've started to expand more into um, our merchandise, our wares like shakers and jiggers, um, looking to get some new um, like knives uh, for the cutting down as well. Um, we've started expanding into juice as well because um, with uh, labor costs being a bit more challenging because of COVID, you know, if you don't have the labor to have fresh juice, we can deliver that as well. Um, and juice has sort of segued us into a new product, which we have, it's called the penny pouch. Um, it's a non-alcoholic pre-frozen pre-diluted cocktail mixer. All you have to do is add two ounces of booze. Don't need to shake with ice, uh, serve it and you're done. Uh, we have four flavors right now. And we're working on, we've, we've pretty sure we finalized three more and we're working on a fourth, but that's still a little up in the air. But um, we wanted to bring the bar home because a lot of us who are used to going to bars or bartending don't have that outlet these days. So um, that and allowing people to be their own bartender. So it's kind of these like templates that for people who don't have a lot of bartending knowledge, it's really easy to make a cocktail that you'd be used to like a Moscow mule or a bee's knees um, or a pina colada. And for the bartenders, you know, you can take the templates and make um, like a, what did I make recently? Like a Brooklynite or a Miami vice and a little bit more interesting and engaging things that you might not normally have because I don't know, I've, I've purchased, you know, cocktail mixers and stuff like that. And you sometimes I'll go through, all of the juice and syrups they give me, but these are, you know, per cocktail pouches and they're frozen. So, you know, if you only want one cocktail a night, you don't have to worry about any waste. You don't have to worry about making your own ginger syrup or honey syrup, any sort of thing like that. So, um, we really tried to diversify our 
our portfolio and our offerings to help people still make cocktails at home. Um, and my one of my thoughts, and hopefully when bars and restaurants open up on a on a greater scale, is you know if you don't want to spend the money uh, or labor on a cocktail program or worrying about making your own ginger syrup or stuff like that, like these pouches are easy substitutions for your bartenders to be able to make cocktails on the spot, but you don't have to worry about stocking pineapple juice and coconut syrup and stuff like that. So um, we'll see. I mean, we're all in this together and mm -hmm. trying to figure out new ways, but yeah, those are the, those are the main things we're working on right now. Cool. And then um, last question is um, what is your favorite social media platform for the brand? And uh, actually two questions then, and how can people um, find you on, on the web? Yeah, our biggest uh, social media engagement right now is Instagram at Penny Pound Ice. Um, we have a lot of actual videos on there of breaking down blocks, of chainsawing blocks, of the Penny Pouch and the Penny Pouch demo. Um, in terms of uh, contacting us directly, just pennypoundice.com. There's a content link on there as well. Or there's also a shop link if you want to try some of these things that we've talked about as well. You can order that through the store there. Um, for those of you who may be farther away or um, want to just give us a test run, um, we've been fortunate enough to partner with a lot of the Bristol farms in Southern California. So if you have a Bristol farm near you and you want to check out some ice uh, from them while you're grocery shopping, uh, go there. And if they don't have any ice there, then ask them about Penny Pound, which would be really great for me. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, Instagram is our biggest is our biggest platform, so engagement on that is is easiest for us. But call, email, snail mail, whatever, we're here. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time. And uh, I, when this thing lifts, man, I gotta grab a drink with you. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. So once again, thank you to both Scott and Gordon for not only their time, but a lot of their insights around all things ice. So we mentioned a lot of stuff during this podcast, so we'll have links to all the things we've talked about in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 180, and we're going to put a couple of um, really cool Instagram accounts in there to give you some inspiration for all things ice. So head on over to mixologytalk.com slash 180, and uh, yeah, we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future. Uh, but until then, I hope you guys are having... Um, a few cocktails and staying safe and healthy. Cheers, and we'll talk to you soon.